Good morning, everyone. We are going to start our service. Please, if you want to stay outside and want to enter, please join us in worship. Uh, make a blessing. If you want to stand on your feet, uh, just see what happens. Oh, 
Well, good morning, and you may be seated. So. Thank you, Worship Team. I think that music just goes so well with what Waldemar is going to be preaching about today. And uh, he's on his own today. <laughs> so I always love that. It gives me a little bit of a breather. And I also, also always get to learn something. So that's a wonderful thing.
so I, I grew up in church, so my parents and I, I've been bringing me to church for a long time since I was in kindergarten, probably for school. Um, but I remember on um, eighth grade winter retreat, our, our eighth grade, our youth group had taken a trip, a retreat to a place, and our pastor was like, it was his last year, so he was really laying in that day. He was like, all right, you, if you don't like accept Jesus, you're going to be, you know, you'll be going to hell. You're going to be serious about it. So I was like, oh. I want to go to hell. <laughs> so, Jesus, if you're real, I don't really know, but, uh, you know, please, you know, come to my heart. And then ever since then, it was just kind of a, a long journey of, I guess, you know, just maybe bit by bit more and more. I think I had always kind of believed, but I never really accepted Jesus until that point. So. All right, and now you're in Indonesia. How did that happen? Um, so... I have been thinking about going overseas for a long time ever since I went to Cambodia on a youth missus trip. I had that was my first year in college. So ever since then I was thinking about maybe maybe God wants me to serve overseas. But um, I never really I went to a few other places trying to figure out if that's what God wanted for me, but um, nothing really kind of stood out. And I think I was waiting for like God to be like this is the place now. <laughs> this is where you must go. <laughs> that's kind of how a lot of us experience. Yeah. So, you know, that's, yeah, so I was expecting. That didn't happen. So I kind of just worked, you know, I worked in the office until 2016, actually. I came on a, my friend's vision trip. So my friend was like, oh, I kind of want to go overseas to serve and part from Muslims. I'm going to Indonesia to come. Said, yeah, that sounds like a great vacation. <laughs> so I came to uh, here to Bandung, and then I guess that's kind of history. I think um, I saw that you know um, this could be a path for me. As in, I wasn't really sure that this is what God wanted, but I knew that He wanted us to love people, especially even people in other countries. So I decided to take a risk and come. And that was so I came. I think um, 2000. 2000 17, late 2017 maybe, uh, five years ago, wherever five years ago is now today. So, uh, I don't know, is there more of that story? I don't know, you uh, tell us, what did you do while you were here? Well, I tried to start a business. So that's kind of one of the things I was, I think, um, one of the things that I was really learning about and kind of convicted by is ministry of work, if you've ever heard about that. It's really this idea that you know, all Christians are called to do ministry. And most of us are actually in the marketplace, and that's where we are. We're working, we're serving God to that, and we're called to serve. You know, um, the Bible says, you know, everything you do, do it for the good, to the glory of God, right? And I think um, that was kind of, this was kind of my expression of that. You know, come to Indonesia and serve God to work, and hopefully be able to um, love Indonesian people through work. Um, so I tried to start a business, and... Um, didn't do so well. <laughs> so, yeah, but I think I learned a lot. And, you know, someone told me, you know, what Tata that's something that John always tells me is, uh, you know, I think when God brings people overseas, there are two reasons. And um, one of the reasons is to like, love the people that are there, but the second reason is so that you can change. And I think that's definitely happened. You know? So I think I definitely feel God's love to me and the way He's working in my life and how He's changed my. Um, mindset and perspective during these past five years. So I'm definitely really thankful and grateful for my time. I don't regret it at all. If people ask me that. <laughs> so. so how did God call you to work with young people and young adults? Um, so, that, so I was here for five years. And then that whole time, for the first four years, I spent learning language, but mostly trying to get the business set up. Um, and then in February, so everything shut down. The business shut down. I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And the whole time I was, something someone told me was, well, something that I read was that, oh, you shouldn't get involved with the local church if you want your business to do well. Like, in terms of going overseas to, to serve, because he said, you're going to be split. So I was always like, oh, I'm not going to serve at that. I'm not going to serve at that. <laughs> but then uh, when my business shut down, I was like, oh, well, I guess. Uh, and then uh, Rosemary on Blue asked me, and it was actually kind of right timing, because that's when the business just shut down. I was like, well, now I don't really have a reason to say no. I remember Rosemary asked me, oh, well, I wonder how can you do it? She's like, kind of like testing me a little bit. I was like, oh, I wonder if he's willing to say it. I was like, oh, I'm too busy with work. But she kept asking, and you know, on February sometime, I think, maybe March. 
And she asked, and I, I said yes. So I think the first thing was with the hangout, actually, that was. Um, that kind of took off. This week we have, this is my last week, but we have 30 people coming today. They usually average around 20, but I kind of sold the fact that it was my last week. We got 10 more people. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think that's kind of how it started. Oh, youth. Um, how did that start? Uh, I don't even remember. Um, oh, that's right. Oh, at the time, because yeah, during COVID, there was no youth, right? And then the kids were just not doing anything. <laughs> I still remember. They just see, <laughs> they just see like hanging around in the back and just doing nothing. And then we had talked about it with uh, Rosemary and Walmart. And they go, oh yeah, we should do something for you. And would you be willing to um, do something? Yes. And I think it was kind of in conjunction with Christy. And then Christy was already doing something with the younger kids and some of the older kids that were willing to go. And I just kind of took those guys, the older guys. Yeah. So it's been step by step for sound like it is for a lot of you. You're like, what's next? What's next? What's next? And just by saying yes over and over, Sam's had a great impact. Do you just want to say anything about Sam in Indonesian or in English? Lisa? No, yeah. If you don't know, then if you can say something that you'll learn. Something that I taught you that you want to plan, right? <laughs> you would learn the word or you learn what they are? What are Gentiles? The people that are not Jews. Oh, nice. Okay. Rafael. Ada yang ingin belajar? Satu hal aja. Bisa bahasa aja. Satu hal. Atau untuk saya, kata-kata aja tentang saya. Saya cakar anak, kan?
Ida ficou vindo de Sanger, recebendo o posto do meu professor, para ver o estado de ponto de local, e aqui eu quero conversar com o aspecto da faculdade que eu ouvi o filho de nós com eles, e eu ouvi o aspecto da mesma alternativa que fala de dizer que eu preciso. There's a lot of economies, uh, this big guy with a warm heart, with, with a nice smile. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, that will see the faith that, uh, and love that he already planted here in Indonesia for others. Let it grow with the help of the Holy Spirit. Bless uh, Sam's heart, Lord, and guide uh, his next steps in the future. Thank you, Lord. You are the man you have. God will always be with our son, whatever he goes into the world. Dear Lord, we are so thankful, we are so grateful to have Sam here with us. Thank you for his friendship, thank you for his heart, thank you for his witness that brings somehow humorous and love into our lives. I mean, his kindness, his friendliness and stuff. We, we will miss <laughs> all this stuff. So we are so thankful for him and that, that he will be back uh, with his family uh, and his friends there and that he, yeah, safely home and can find uh, the door that you are preparing for him for so long. Even now he don't he doesn't really have many plans, but we believe that you are with him wherever he goes, and that yeah, and that we that he can uh, grow more and more uh, in you, yeah, and and yeah, and be uh, blessings like he did here in Indonesia. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for Sam. I thank you that you brought him to us and for his willing heart to serve. And as he takes this next step of his journey, Lord, we just cover him. We just praise mighty as family that you would bless him, that you would open the doors in front of him, that you would give him great joy and the love that we've experienced here from him, that that would be shared where he's going. We also ask that you give him a wife after his own heart and Amen. after your heart who would love the world and love him and his family. Lord, you know what it is that the longing of his heart is. And we do pray for this part as well. We pray for good work. We pray for meaningful work. And we pray that as he works that he would be your servant in every context. So we ask your blessing on him. And we offer our blessing as an IES family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As you take your lunch, don't forget us. <laughs> don't forget the heart of Indonesia. Pray God bless you, Sam. Thank you so much. We just appreciate you so much. You might as well stay here because... Uh... This is the Old Testament reading from Nehemiah 9. 
Lord, may your glorious name be praised. May it be lifted high above every other name that is blessed and praised. You are the one and only Lord. You made the heavens. You made even the highest heavens. You created all of the stars in the sky. You created the earth and everything that is on it. You made the oceans and everything that is in them. You give life to everything. Every living being in heaven worships you. You are the Lord God. You chose Abram. You brought him out of Ur in Babylonia. You named him Abraham. You knew that his heart was faithful to you. And you made a covenant with him. You promised to give to his children, after him, a land of their own. You have kept your promise. That is because you always do what is right and fair. You saw how our people suffered long ago in Egypt. You heard them cry out to you at the Red Sea. You did miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh. You sent plagues on all his officials. In fact, you sent them on all of the people of Egypt. You know how they treated our people. They looked down on them, but you made a name for yourself, and that name remains to this very day. You parted the Red Sea for the people of Israel. They passed through it on dry ground, but you threw into the sea those who chased them. They sank down like a stone into the mighty waters. By day, you led them with a pillar of cloud. At night, you led them with a pillar of fire. You gave them light to show them the way you wanted them to go. You came down on Mount Sinai. From heaven, you spoke to our people. You gave them rules and laws. Those laws are right and fair. You gave them orders and commands that are good. You taught them about your holy Sabbath day. You gave them commands, orders, and laws. You didn't do your servant Moses. When the people were hungry, you gave them bread from heaven. When they were thirsty, you brought them water out of a rock. You told them to go into the land of Canaan. You told them to take it as their own. It was the land you had promised to give them. You had even raised your hand and taken an oath to do it. Because you loved them so much, you didn't leave them in the desert. During the day, the pillar of cloud didn't stop guiding them on their path. At night, the pillar of fire didn't stop shining on the way you wanted them to go. You gave them your good spirit to teach them. You didn't hold back your manna from their mouths, and you gave them water when they were thirsty. For forty years, you took good care of them in the desert. They had everything they needed, their clothes didn't wear out, and their feet didn't swell up. I will read from New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1. Give praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Those blessings come from the heavenly world. They belong to us because we belong to Christ. God chose us to belong to Christ before the world was created. He chose us to be holy and without blame in His eyes. He loved us. So he decided long ago to adopt us as a children. He did it because of what Jesus Christ has done. It pleased God to do it. All those things bring praise to his glorious grace. God freely gave us his grace. We have been set free because of what Christ has done. Through his blood, our sins have been forgiven. We have been set free because God's grace is so rich. He poured his grace on us by giving us great wisdom and understanding. He showed us the mystery of his brain. It was in Jubilee. He marked you with a seal, the seal in Holy Spirit that he promised. The Spirit marked us as a God's own. We can now be sure that someday we will receive all that God has promised, that will happen after God set us of his people completely free. All of, this, all of those things will bring praise to his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be Thank to God. God. Thank you so much to those who are doing the reading for Sam and to the reading. So let me pass this back to my notebook. So, welcome to IES Bandung and uh, to the second Sunday of 2023. This is going to be a little bit different, obviously, because Rosemary isn't up here with me. 
And uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to tell you a story. The title for the talk this morning is A Light on the Path. And it's the story of how I ended up sitting here in front of you. And uh, this is going to be personal. I want you also, as I'm talking, to reflect on your personal story. One of the most common things that Rosemary and I are asked especially when we speak to young people, is how can we know where God is leading us? How can we know what's next? So I want to tell you the story of how I came here, okay? And it's going to be, parts of this are going to be Rosemary's story as well. Uh, am I just speaking back? Okay. Let me move just over a bit, maybe away from that speaker, okay. So, I'm going to leave Rosemary's portions of the story for her, and if you ask her nicely, maybe she'll tell you her story as well, because it's different from mine, at least portions of it. Um, the Bible is full of stories. Estimates are that up to half of the Bible, at least 43% of the Bible, the stories, and we learn a lot through the stories. Our Old Testament reading this morning was a story, right? The story starts in Genesis 1 with God's creation of everything, and Genesis 12, the story of Abram starts, and then in Exodus 1, we start to have the story of Israel's suffering, and a few chapters later, their rescue starts, and then the part about the pillar of uh, fire and the cloud that we start reading about in Exodus 13. It's an important story. It's so important that it isn't told just once. We have it in Exodus. In Numbers, the story is retold. In Deuteronomy, the people of Israel retell a big portion of the story of their wandering in the desert. And I don't know if you noticed, but our Old Testament reading was actually from Nehemiah. When was the book of Nehemiah written? Well, that was after Israel had gone into captivity again. They'd been in Egypt. They went back to Babylon because they had worshipped foreign gods and so on. And now they come back. They've rebuilt the wall. They've rebuilt the temple. And part of their celebration is telling the story. So stories are important. My story actually begins a number of years before I was born. <laughs> How does that work? Well, my mom was a little girl, about eight years old, and her parents, living in Poland, wanted to immigrate to Canada or the United States. The problem was, my mom's mom was pregnant, and the airline wouldn't let them fly. Her younger brother was born in September of 1939. That's also the year that Poland was invaded. So the plan to immigrate kind of fell apart. Now, that's kind of interesting, of course. Uh, they ended up staying in Poland, and Rosemary has some really interesting stories from her family of things that happened during the war as well. So fast forward about 20 years. My Polish mom has now married my German dad, okay? She has a university degree in math. He has a university degree in civil engineering. My dad really wants to move to Canada. Uh, he has some relatives there already. My mom is not so sure. And when I talked to my mom to ask about what happened, she said, well, we had a discussion. I want you to know it wasn't a fight. <laughs> you know, but they had a discussion about leaving Poland and her family and so on. And she said to my dad, if we can get the papers really quickly, then I will agree that we go. And the impossible happened. At that point in Poland's history, if you had university degrees, you weren't allowed to immigrate. But somehow, they, my parents got the permissions in very short order. And they, together with me, I was less than two years old, left Poland and moved to Canada. Was this part of God's light on their path? 
Was it God who had worked out, uh, letting the officials give them the visa to emigrate and immigrate into Canada? I think so. God works things out along the story. We moved to a place called Winnipeg in Canada. Winnipeg is a place where people should not live. <laughs> okay. In the winter, it gets down to minus 40. Uh, and it happens that in the uh, way the um, um, thermometer works, it's minus 40 Celsius, also minus 40 Fahrenheit. It's one of those temperatures where it's the same. Okay? Uh, by the way, the summers in Winnipeg, they have big mosquitoes. The, the joke is the mosquitoes are big enough to carry you away and have you as a feast. No. Anyway, um, my dad's engineering degree wasn't accepted in Canada. So he worked as a common laborer, painted houses. That, that's basically all he could do. I think my mom had a very difficult time. She tries not to complain, but she had a difficult time. She's far away from her family, from her people, from her country, from everything that she found familiar. We were part of a German community, church, but Polish and German is not exactly the same, and the people are not exactly the same, and you know, it's, it's different. After two years in Winnipeg, and I'm now less than four years old, we moved to a little town called Chilliwack. It's on the west coast, it's about 100 kilometers from Vancouver, which is on the ocean. Weather was much better. Now, uh, one of the problems with that area of the world is they have a lot of gray days, lots of rain. In fact, the winter before we moved to Indonesia, we had a stretch of 57 days where the sun did not shine. Wow. 57 days where there was no blue visible in the sky at all. For people who need sunshine to be happy, that was not a good thing, okay? And Rosemary and I are really happy to be here, okay? We're glad that God called us to this beautiful country and so on. I can see it. Well, I spoke Polish and German, very little English, even though I was living in Canada, because my life at home was Polish and German, right? That's what my parents spoke. And our church was all in German, uh, I will have to tell you that in our church, we were not sure that people who spoke English would actually go to heaven. <laughs> we were pretty sure that German people would get there, but English people, we weren't sure. Okay. Um, so, as you can imagine, things were a little bit difficult for this weird little boy who goes to school and can't speak the language. Had a lot of difficulty. One of the events I do remember is one day I, I got my hands strapped in school because I had drawn a rude picture of our teacher. And I don't even remember what the picture was. I think it just was a picture and I said she was stupid or something like that. But anyway, I got strapped in school and when I got home, I got another spanking because I had good parents. <laughs> and so, you know, that was the first couple of years of school, not very happy. I don't think I enjoyed it. Things changed when I was about nine years old. We were in a German Pentecostal church. One of our beliefs, uh, if you're a Pentecostal, is that the Holy Spirit is still at work today. And at the age of nine, I was filled with the Spirit. I spoke in tongues, and I know we could have all sorts of discussions about that, because as, especially in a community like IES Van Dome, we've got people who have different understandings and beliefs about things, but here is what I can tell you. My story changed. I don't know if it was as sudden as flipping a switch, but I started to enjoy reading books. I, uh, my understanding of English and ability to speak English improved. Was God directing me, guiding me on the path through how he had made me, through the work of his Holy Spirit? I think so. I think so. God was there. Another thing I loved, and some of you may be able to relate to this, others will think, boy, was that kid ever weird. I loved math and science. I really, really loved math. My dad loved math, and so when I was 10 years old, he taught me how to do calculus. And, you know, we started doing complicated math together and stuff like that. And so, 10, 10 years old was a big age for me. 
I was 10 years old, lying in bed one night, and I heard my voice. My, not my voice, my name. Somebody was calling my name. Well, I had a younger sister by then, five years younger. Wasn't her. I thought it was my dad. I ran to their bedroom. But you know what? They were asleep. I won't say they were snoring, but they were definitely <laughs> asleep. Okay, and I knew they were asleep. So I was puzzled, went back to bed, heard my name again. The third time, I remembered the story of Samuel. And so I said, okay, God, speak. And God told me that someday I would be living overseas, sharing the good news of what God was wanting to do. Was God speaking to me, telling me which way to go? Absolutely yes. Now you say, it would be really cool if God did that for me. Well, what you need to know is that during school, my teachers kept pursuing me and telling me, you need to become a research physicist or a mathematician. Because I was pretty decent at that stuff, and I really enjoyed it. They thought that God had created me to be a mathematician. And I kept telling everybody, no, I'm going to go to Africa. Because Africa was where our church had its overseas ministries, Africa and South America. Why did God need to speak to me so dramatically? It was because I really could have enjoyed becoming a mathematician or a physicist. I needed to know God said, I want you to do this. I needed to be directed on this path. So I think that's why he shared that with me, so that I would know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is what you're supposed to do. There's another important thing that happened when I was 10. <laughs> 10 was a big age for me. Rosemary's family moved to our city. They moved from Winnipeg, that inhospitable, colder than the freezer place, to Chilliwack. And when I saw her as a 10-year-old boy, I was smitten. She was just what I thought was ideal. And honestly, I have to tell you, this was not the most likely match, okay? Of the guys in the church youth group, I was probably the least likely candidate. I was the weird little geeky kid who read the dictionary for fun and had already read through the entire encyclopedia. And uh, Melvie, if you'll put up a picture here. This is the picture of us being baptized. I think I was 10 or 11. Can you guess which one is me? The shortest one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was me. And Rosemary is the one immediately to the side of me there. I, I think she was already beautiful then. But, uh, you know, she's a year older than I am. She's taller than I am. I'm just the weird little geeky kid. <laughs> For the story of how we ended up being married, you're going to have to ask Rosemary. Um, I didn't need convincing. I thought she was the best thing going, honestly. So God didn't need to speak to me about her. But um, anyway, you can ask her about that story. In this case, I didn't need audible voices, scripture passages, thou shalt marry Rosemary, or messages from angels. It was, I liked her. And this, this, you know, God speaks to us in different ways. We won't always do the same thing. In preparation for working in other cultures and so on, I went to Germany. That's where I did my first year of theological training. When I returned to Canada, Rosemary and I started dating, and we were married about a year later. I proposed to her with, will you go to Red China with me? Mm -hmm. I was so romantic. I know, I know. Wasn't that the most romantic proposal you've ever heard of? We graduated from Northwest University together. I started on a master's degree. We were still focused. We're going to go overseas. That's what we're going to do. About a year into my program, I became frustrated. I stopped. I quit. I'll tell you why. I was in a class with probably the world's most foremost expert in ancient Near East Semitic languages, a guy called Bruce Waltke. Uh, he was, I mean, he was as 
He's written the books, you know, on Ugaritic and, and all these languages and stuff like that. And there were students in the class debating Ugaritic pronunciation with him. Nobody knows how the language is pronounced. It's, nobody's spoken it in three or four thousand years, you know. But I was thinking, what in the world does this have to do with what God has called me to do? And I just, I was so frustrated. Stupid thing to do. I know. I'll admit that. Changed our lives, yes. I was started in uh, ministry at Chilliwack Pentecostal Tabernacle. I was church administrator, minister of Christian ed, principal of the Christian Day School. Rosemary and I together were the couple's pastors. Do I think God was leading me, leading us? Well, you know what, I honestly would have to say, in retrospect, the smartest thing in the world was not to quit. I should have kept going. Would have made Rosemary's life easier, she'll tell you that for sure. Was God able to work even though I chose unwisely? <laughs> well, look, if you've read any stories in the Bible, you know about people who made unwise choices and yet God still led them, right? Yeah. So I finished my master's degree in church history, was hired by Northwest to run their computer system and teach, first of all, church history, then later in Pauline letters, and then theology. But what about God's call on my life, on our lives? Why were we not overseas? It's a great question. One to which Rosemary and I might get different answers because our stories are not necessarily identical. Part of it was, as I was teaching in the classroom, it was all about God's great goal of building his kingdom. And I got to tell people about that. It wasn't like I had lost sight of what God wanted to do. Part of it was also that we got to teach overseas. First of all, I started to teach in the Philippines, and then in Singapore, uh, Malaysia, other countries, Rosemary joined me when she got her master's and then her PhD. No, we were not in full-time overseas service. And I know that Rosemary was frustrated by living out her calling in a different way than God had called her to. She tells me years later that she married me only because I was the only guy that she knew in the youth group who probably would end up in overseas work. <laughs> and there we are living in the U.S. <laughs> 2010, it's now 13 years ago, we were teaching in Singapore, we had a Sabbath week. We took that Sabbath week to go to China, visiting Beijing and some other areas. We check into our little hotel, who uh, told on one of the ring roads in Beijing, and we see a cross across the street. We go to check it out Saturday, and it's a church. And the people invite us to come back Sunday morning for a church service. We thought it was communion at, nine, uh, at 8 o'clock, and we get there, and it's actually choir practice. But when we get there, we're, we're basically people squeezed to give us seats because the place is already packed. And then when the church service starts at 9, it's Baptism Sunday. 113 people were baptized that day. Wow. 86 women, 27 men. Rosemary pointed out that, and she was already working on her master's and so on. And um, what that meant for, uh, on, a PhD, on a PhD actually, what that meant for those women was basically many of them were saying we were willing not to ever get married because they weren't going to marry somebody who wasn't a believer. I'm sitting there, tears streaming down my face. I'm being so blessed. Rosemary asked me how I feel. I said, isn't this wonderful? This is what we were called to do. She tells me afterwards she was frustrated. She said, I'm too old to learn a tonal language like Chinese. <laughs> and we're not living here. This is what you what I signed up for. You you asked me whether I'd go to Red China with you. We're here now, and this isn't it. Well, 
Was God leading us even in our choice of the hotel, the package we got to go to China for a week? Uh, we actually got the whole package, flight and hotel and everything, for way cheaper than we could get just the flight. Did God work that out? I think he did. A few years later, it's now about 10 years ago, someone told Rosemary first and then told me about an opportunity to plant a church in Mala, here in Indonesia. We had visited Indonesia, well, we visited Jakarta. Jakarta is in Indonesia, I know. But we visited Indonesia as far as I knew. And we both said yes. Um, we didn't know how beautiful this country actually was and how great you all are. Um, the friends who were already working here said to us, listen, if you're coming, we don't want you to go to Mala. We want you to go to Bandung. Well, all we knew about Bandung was that it's a drink you can get in, in Singapore. It's pink, it's sweet, it's very milky. That's all we knew. Okay, <laughs> that was Bandung. I've got to tell you, that I'm not going to tell you all the stories, but over the next little while, after we said yes and we're preparing to come here, God <coughs> confirmed that we were supposed to go to Bandung in so many ways. Wow. Just one of them. I would get rosemary gardenias every Friday afternoon at the little corner store on my way home from the university because we, we both love the smell of gardenias. And I said to the lady behind the counter, well, you know what, I'm going to stop buying gardenias here in a couple of months because we're moving. She said, so where are you moving? I said, well, to Indonesia. She said, Indonesia? I'm from a little town there called Bandung. Where are you moving? <laughs> I, I, person after person we encountered was from Bandung, had relatives here. And it was God telling us, yep, that's what I want you to do. We moved to Indonesia on July the 1st, 2014. We looked for a house near Imlak. Imlak is the school that's just the other side of this fence. Because that was going to be our language school, and we ended up in a house only a few hundred meters from Greengate from here. We can walk there in five minutes or so. Things happened. Imlak didn't work out as our language school. We discovered that there was already an international church here. We had come here to plant an international church, but there already is one. Well, we attended here. We attended some other Indonesian churches. We studied the language. We studied it pretty poorly, honestly. We taught in other countries. Rosemary taught in Bhutan. I taught, we taught in the Philippines and Singapore and New Zealand, places like that. We started engaging with our neighbors, people we talked to on the uncut and on the street and so on. And we got to know them and let them get to know us. We could tell you so many stories of how God led us on our path. That cloud, that fire, it was there. The Bible has a lot to say about how God leads. And you know, this, this is one of those topics where we could probably go on and, and talk about different ways that God leads you for, for many, many sessions. I want to highlight two scriptures. The first scripture is very well known. It's Romans 8, verse 28. And this is where Paul says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What I want to tell you, is that just as happened to us, to me, especially in my story, if you love God, you can trust Him. If you need an angel blowing a trumpet in your ear to wake you up, God will send that angel. Amen. If you don't need an angel, He'll guide you on a gentler way by putting a desire in your heart, by letting you read something in Scripture that directs your path. If you know and love God, He absolutely will guide you. I know this. My, my story confirms it. So many stories in the Bible confirm it. This is God at work, guiding you, guiding me to where we are. 
The second passage I want to read for you or to leave you with is a little bit more strange. Paul writes the Thessalonian Christians, and this is what he says, For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did, again and again, but Satan blocked our way. Wait a second. How does God use Satan to bring about God's purposes? Well, okay, here's the thing. Paul probably would not have written the two letters to the Thessalonians if he had had a chance to go there and visit them and deliver the sermon in person. Right? I mean, hey, he wanted to give them a message. He couldn't go there because Satan blocked his way. I've got to tell you, the message Paul gave the Thessalonians was clearly one they needed. But I've got to also tell you this. It's one I need today. There are some wonderful topics in Paul's two letters to the Thessalonians that we, things we wouldn't know about if Paul had not been blocked by Satan. I want you to know this. There are going to be things that happen in your life that are adverse, negatives. Things that look like a door has shut. Something has blocked your way. Can God use those to bring about his good purposes? Yes. Absolutely yes. <laughs> he is, after all, the God who made everything. He's the one who's in charge of this universe. I love that we have these letters. God overruled Satan's bad intention, brought about something wonderful for both the Thessalonians but also for us. You can trust God to work, no matter what the circumstances. So, what would have happened if my mom's family had been able to immigrate in 1939? She probably wouldn't have met my dad. I probably wouldn't be here today. <laughs> now, does that mean God's kingdom can't do what God's kingdom is supposed to do? No. God doesn't need me. God gives me the privilege of being part of his kingdom, as he's given you that privilege as well. It is a great honor for us to be able to serve God where he has put us, whatever he has called you to do. And as Sam was talking about, uh, you know, serving God in our work, that's all a part of God's plan. But would I be here if God had not, you know, brought about circumstances of my grandma being pregnant and, you know, all that stuff? What would have happened if Rosemary and I had ended up in Africa or South America back in the 1980s instead of me ending up at Northwest University for almost 30 years? God's work would still have been built. His kingdom would have been built, perhaps in a different way. Um, I, I've got to say that um, coming as we did in our 50s, with our children already grown, uh, with a number of different factors involved in education and, and, and my white hair, and different things like that, uh, they let us do different things here than you can do if you're 20 and 30. Not, not saying that this is better, that that's worse, it's just different. And one of the cool things is, as Paul points out, we are all members of a body and we have different functions. What God has called you to do is not exactly what God has called me to do. But all together, we are his body and we get to do work together. So that's a part of my story. What about your story? Think back. In what ways has God guided you and your family? Who was it in your household who first came to faith? It might be me. But maybe there's somebody else who brought you along on the journey to Christ. How did that happen? What is God asking you to do today or down the road? Are you willing to obey him even if you don't fully understand? Where in the world is
is this cloud and this fire too. So, anybody here have a takeaway, something they'd like to share, or? but really God's kind of leading you towards a path. And I think I definitely see that um, in hindsight. So it's great to I'm reminded of that as I hear you guys story. So where you're not taking, don't forget us.
and we are two real because we are from two different countries and marrying in Germany is it's really hard. Mm -hmm. And just in two weeks time we really got an answer. But before that we had a lot of yeah, closed doors and we thought it would not come to happen. So knowing that God is really working blessings in disguise, that was just that was something that I really learned again and thought that okay, God is yeah, even even if the path is not straight, mm -hmm. yeah, you will not be my side. And that was yeah, something that was reminded as you were talking about your story. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I think what I, what I got from, from your testimony is it, it's clear how um, I know you, you were, became a Christian when you were young, and then as soon as that happened, I think it, it just kind of similar to your experience. To um, I became a Christian when I was an adult, and but soon after that, God gave me a call. Um, but it takes a lot of faith because it's kind of like you tell God, okay, you're my personal manager. You tell me what to do. Okay. Um, so we'll just follow you. Okay. But yes, we will think that it's it's weird, it's it's strange, and it's difficult, but if we trust him as our personal manager, it will work out. And yes, when when you actually become a Christian, he will give you a calling. Mm -hmm. And but then, like I said, if it, it takes faith, especially for both of you, because I know how strange what would probably sound to you, especially when you were a young kid and okay, you're going to be overseas. <laughs> So, yes, it, it is strange sometimes because um, God gave, actually gave me a call to be a teacher, but then before I became a Christian, uh, a Christian I, um, I would never ever have thought that I would be a teacher. So, I think, yes, thank you for following your faith, following your calling to uh, Indonesia. I'll just say again, we are so happy to be here. <laughs> on, a, on a morning like this, when we could be in the snow and the cold, no thank you. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> yeah. Any others? One more. Okay. Yeah, when uh, Prof. Voldemort was talking about calling, I remember in Hebrew that uh, Jesus, sorry, uh, God was speaking in many ways. And then in my thinking, when God uh, calls you or speaks to you or talks to you, uh, God is also leading. So. When he when he uh, says something or he talks something, he speaks to us. He's leading. Mm -hmm. And also something interesting when uh, Voldemort talked about Satan block our way. Mm -hmm. I also remember uh, when the angel talked to Daniel that uh, Satan block his way. Mm -hmm. I, I've got a new perspective in this. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's good to have God's reading. Rosemary, will you uh, serve communion with me? Okay. We're going to celebrate communion together. And if you've not received the elements, this is part of what we do as a body. We've talked about how God has put all of these different parts together. And we together are one body in Him. We have the privilege, we do this every week because we think it's so important. 
And we're going to celebrate that together and making sure that everybody has the element. And, you know, let's stand for, for doing this. We often stand as a sign of respect. Let's, let's stand together as a sign of respect for what we are celebrating together. Paul tells us this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So please take your bread and eat together with us. His body broken for us. Father, we do pray for those who are in need of your healing touch. Uh, we think of the call we received this morning for a brother of one of our people here who is in need of healing. We think of others we know of. Thank you, God, that you love us, care for us, and that in your stripes we are healed. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. His blood shed for us. Let's drink together. Whatever your story is, wherever you are on the path today, let's thank God for his body and his blood. Lord, we just can't even imagine how you lead us, how well you know us, how well you know the opportunities that you put in front of us, and where you've protected us by putting a hedge around us or closing a door. And Lord, maybe it hasn't even been about us. Maybe it's been about our family or about a neighbor or like for Paul, being able to go in a different direction and bring the good news in places where it had never been known before. So Jesus, as we accept your healing, the healing in your body and the forgiveness in your blood, we just say be in our story. In this new year, Lord, be with us on the path. Guide us, give us obedient hearts. Help us to love you as we never loved you before. And as you said to your disciples, if we love you, we will do what you say. So give us a love for the scriptures which tell us what you ask of us. Give us a love for your church, for your community in the world to give generously of our time, our energy, our funds. Lord, just give us hearts that love you beyond anything else and let us be a blessing with your love. Let us be streams of living water this year. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So as your benediction, just as God's word was sent into the world to heal and to redeem, so God sends you into the world this day to be light and love, healing and hope. Go now to be light for the world. And may the grace and peace of God, the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer come upon you this day and remain with you always. We, we go, go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Express to some